Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. Our topic today is on COVID and lessons learned over the past year from the COVID pandemic. I am very pleased and happy to have our expert today be Dr. Rob Lowe, the Medical Director for Columbus Division of Fire. Dr. Lowe, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. We are very excited to have you here. Um, and we're interested to hear about your experience uh, dealing with the pandemic in your first year as medical director for Columbus Fire. So uh, I'm just going to get started right away and, you know, ask you to think about a year ago, last February and March, when we were really unsure how this pandemic was going to play out. Uh, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, what was going through your mind and and what were you doing to prepare yourself as well as the department for a potential pandemic? Yeah, thinking back a year ago, it seems, boy, it seems way longer than that, doesn't it? Um, I would I would say thinking about the first of the year, you know, we kind of knew this was on the horizon. Some of us were looking at it. We'd, we'd sort of lived through this with uh, Ebola and the lessons learned in Central Ohio from, from that. Um, we were aware when a problem popped up out in on the West Coast in uh, in the Washington State area, um, and so we had gotten a little bit of a flavor of ooh, these are some of the operational things that uh, that might be the secondary impacts. Uh, but once you have your first case locally, that's when things become very real. So I would say we had a little bit of an understanding. We knew a little bit of what we wanted to dust off, um, but sometimes you just don't know what you're in until you're in it. Um, and with our first uh, positive case. Uh, then the learning really accelerated because of all the secondary effects, and, and we can dive into that. But um, I would say we felt reasonably prepared, um, and I think like the rest of the country, we just learned a lot because the disease was so unknown. We had to learn a lot about the disease along the way, uh, which was different. It was different than preparing for Ebola because we at least knew that disease. We could look up and learn about that disease, and this was so new. So. Yeah, it's a good point about the novelty of the disease, and I think – that's probably one distinguishing feature of this pandemic compared to infectious emergencies that we've dealt with in the past, like Ebola or a variant of the flu. Uh, those were known viral entities that uh, we had information on regarding uh, PPE, how to keep providers and family members safe, uh, clinical care and so forth. And uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the the novel SARS virus uh, really was new, it, and it threw a wrench into a lot of how we approached and protocolized interactions as well as station operations. Um, when it comes to the clinical care, um, what are some things that uh, you learned that were important that affected how you protocolized uh, the patient interactions? Um, I would say several things. So there was uh, there was lessons learned at, at dispatch. So you know, in this, initially we were trying to do um, some screening on on travel or fever, um, and obviously we pretty quickly exceeded any kind of uh, ability to catch something on travel. Uh, I think a year later, most of us would would note that a lot of our COVID patients weren't necessarily febrile patients either, but we were at least trying to do some screening up front so that providers had that uh, warning. Uh, going in, and one of the things that would uh, pop up is, is it's just a dispatch uh, name. So um, knowing that you're going on a on an illness that was a contagious emergency versus, you know, going on a chest pains or something uh, to that effect. So I'd say that was step one, a warning of of what to get into. Um, step two was uh, pretty quickly we had developed some training. We have ability to push things out. Um, in a uh, in a management learning type system, and so we had developed some training just real quick of how to get in and out of PPE without uh, contaminating yourself, and what the appropriate PPE was, and and on which cases you do that. And then the other thing we had uh, we had from dispatch do is um, we started moving patients, which not hard, but it was a little bit novel for EMS. So, you know, it was one of the first times where we said. All right, uh, you know, crews are on the way. If possible, can you meet the crew at the front door? Uh, can you move them from a from a back room to the front room? If it's, you know, as we went into warm weather, it was meet them on the on the porch or things like that. Um, kind of for a safety of of all involved. In the very beginning, we really just we weren't sure what the exposures were. Were you know were other members of the household exposing crews? Were 
what's the chance that that we uh you know unintentionally expose some folks and so um working through those aspects and then once we were in the truck what were sort of delineating out what was uh an absolutely necessary treatment and what was a nice to have treatment um you know we ems we do breathing treatments on a pretty regular basis uh but then in a in a respiratory disease that became do we have the right uh nebulizer to capture exhaust um, or is this something that it was prudent and perhaps better treatment for all involved uh, that that wait five minutes until the hospital uh, versus the back of the ambulance even what airway device we selected did we go with a you know on a superglottic airway versus a traditional intubation a lot of those things were were changing pretty dynamically in those early days yeah those are all great points especially about like what you said about the just-in-time training for, you know, the whole EMS encounter from dispatch to uh, preparing to go on the run to the patient encounter, uh, and even before EMS arrives on scene. Um, one of the unique things that I noticed early on was, you know, how this got into the fire station, right? And um, with previous experience, there was a lot of focus on the patient encounter or the clinical encounter. But I, I remember hearing conversations about, you know, masking in stations. Uh, do we need to change clothes when we get back? What about, you know, wearing boots? Do we need to take boots off before we go into quarters? And all those things that I would have just never thought about before this pandemic. How did you approach that aspect of, of the pandemic, the non-clinical side, uh, especially with uh, Columbus Fire and having so many different types of stations and station designs. How did that? How did that impact you as the medical director? It, yeah, it's you know one of the. There's so many unique things around this disease, but yeah, it it crept its way into way more operational aspects uh, beyond just the call, like you said. Um, and a part of that, again, this novel disease that we really didn't know, and we didn't know, but we knew it was infectious. Um, it really, it became a bigger and bigger worry um, and not necessarily inappropriately. It just, it started to consume things a little bit. Um, so, you know, right away we had to deal with issues of uh, if it's an exposure, do, you know, do folks, do we go off duty as soon as you take care of that patient, as soon as we find out that patient, the 24 hour kind of rule, you know, obviously as COVID has, has gone on, everyone's more familiar now that it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, the two days prior of, of having symptoms and, and feeling like that infectious. So that, that aspect was of it. Um, coming back to the station, you know, what did we, what did we do with, uh, with clothing that we're in? Did we go to a separate location in, in Warsh? Uh, coming off duty, did we send them home? You know, there was a, there was a big question about whether we needed to house them in a, in a different location. And some of those had been discussions that had happened in, in Ebola time. So we weren't totally making it up, but in a new disease, there was an absence of guidance. Every day the guidance was changing. What was the lessons learned from who? What was the lessons uh, from CDC? Uh, the things that we could refer to, uh, we were in constant contact with, you know, local experts as, as well. So I think that was interesting, but then the, just the everyday station life, like you talked about, all of a sudden it was, can we all eat at the same table? Um, do we cook our own food? Can one cook cook for us? And what's our exposure risk if the, tomorrow the cook is sick? And uh, just a lot of pieces that hadn't hadn't happened before. Fortunately, we learned, you know, a little bit later that uh, you know exposure through cooking, especially when you're when you're making warm foods, was less, and uh, the masking issue came up, but. I think we have to remind ourselves, remember the situation we were in, you know, uh, looking back, we didn't adopt masks in the station right away, but there was also this just nationwide concern for the amount of PPE. You know, did we have enough PPE? Um, initially, the general public didn't necessarily mask because we were preserving masks for healthcare workers. Uh, so it was there every day there was some sort of new lesson and new guidance and and we just had to find our way uh, through the pieces of what science was available and when science wasn't available, what were the reasonable cross applications from other disease? And then just what was the reasonable common sense exposure kind of things to do? And, and sometimes those change. Sometimes what was common sense on Monday was no longer common sense on Friday. Yeah, you, your comment on the frequency of the changes, um, 
we're just learning a ton of new data almost daily uh, in, in the first several weeks of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, your COVID operational plans were excellent and well done. And we all learned a lot from those and based a lot of our decisions on your work and uh, the work of the division on the COVID operational plans. As a medical director, how did you balance getting new information out in a timely manner versus overwhelming your department with uh, too frequent updates? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And we so that operational plan was that was a huge endeavor, and you know many many fabulous contributors down here at, at Columbus Fire. But that was the method. So. Um, I, I got to give our, our planners and our experts within the division credit on that. Uh, the plan was each day there's going to be a plan. It's printed out. You know, it's on the table for the for the people to see. And this was just absolutely what were the operational aspects you need to know. How did you flip that thing open and and see? And so uh, those who have seen our plan know, you know, on the on the very first page there would be a yellow highlights. These were the new changes today, uh, kind of things. Um, then there was a list of objectives and a list of directives, and that. The objectives kept us, uh, the plan writers all organized and the, and the planning committee organized and the directives were specific orders to uh, to the stations, right? Um, so things as simple as uh, immediately uh, suspending visitors, uh, the things you're familiar with now with locked doors and, and those sort of things, uh, riders, how to, and then instructions of how did you log your time off and in our uh, employment software, just all of those aspects there. And so we literally were a daily plan and I'm, it, it was a pace of operations. You know, we'd have a, in the early days, the planning meeting might be a, an hour or might be an hour and a half. Uh, and then there was a lot of product to churn out so that that thing could be published in, in everybody's hands uh, when shift change occurred the next morning. Uh, and obviously over time, uh, as we learned more and as things got uh, more robust as our our planning got more complete. We were able to stretch those out. We went to a week and we went to two weeks. Currently, we're in a month uh, planning cycle. Um, and from the get-go, we sort of had to prioritize uh, things as well. And so uh, when we prioritized it, our, our lesson number one, or our, our objective number one was protect the workforce. Uh, and then objective number two, obviously tied to number one, is preserve the mission, right? So the mission to care for patients and respond to emergencies um, doesn't happen if we can't protect the workforce. And, and so whenever issues or questions came up, it always came back to one of those two uh, goals, protect the workforce, pre um, preserve the mission. So. Uh, that's an excellent summary. Um, I know throughout this, um, you were able to utilize uh, data as well as public health resources uh, to help inform some of those decisions about clinical care as well as keeping your workforce safe. Um, what are some things that you learned about the public health EMS interface during this pandemic? That that's been an amazing partnership. And I would say, you know, as you take these lessons learned, there's broad lessons and there's specific lessons. And we always talk about in disaster. One of the broad lessons is make those phone calls and connections before the day of the event. Uh, and that was hugely re demonstrated here. So. You know, the fact that uh, through various local organizations, we had we had worked with public health, both on a personal level, you know, me knowing those, those people, but the institutions having worked together before um, was huge. It was huge in the amount of trust that existed immediately. So when questions need to be asked, uh, there was unknown things, those direct connections. Um, but we also had to kind of uh, recognize the workload that was going on on both sides. So, for example, in that action plan we talked about, uh, one of the things we did internally at Columbus Fire is we limited the people at Columbus Fire who would talk to public health, and public health did the same thing. This is this is your point of contact, so that that information could flow in a very structured, uh, organizational manner without fifty people asking the same question of fifty different people and and too much repetitive things happening uh, when the workload was was high. So it was fantastic. So for an example, um, one of the things we did with with public health, you know. Uh, contact tracing was a big deal uh, in this event, continues to be um, a, a pretty big task as well. And so we just synergistically um, worked with health. Health allowed us to do the contact tracing on our side. So uh, if Firefighter Jones had an exposure or Firefighter Jones came down sick and those people that, that may have been labeled contacts within the station, 
we were able to do that and just pass that information to health so that they didn't have to do that part of the tracking. Flip side for us, that let us make decisions a lot sooner um, so that we knew what we were dealing with in the next shift's workforce, you know. Uh, so if this happened on a, on a Tuesday, what was going to be the impact on Friday's uh, shift staffing and things like that? It was just, it was a great relationship. Secondarily to that, um, you ask about data, that was huge, you know, and, and we're fortunate that we have a little bit of a system with, uh, with our safety officers and our infection control anyway. But to be able to track those folks um, from the get-go, and, and you never know for sure whose exposures are where, but you at least had some of that uh, some of that going on, we were able pretty early on to determine our people in quarantine if they were going to get sick by what day were they going to get sick. Um, and it's information that we all generally accept now, right, that the most common onset was probably around five days and that the chances of getting sick after day 10 were pretty small. Um, but we saw that pretty early, and so we were able to present that uh, to public health and say, Hey, in our operational crunches, um, can we think about knowing our own data says no one's really sick after day 10? Um, can we can we look at scaling back from a work standpoint uh, that that quarantine period uh, as applies to work, knowing full well that when they go home, they still, you know, wherever they live, whatever public health entity they're under, those those rules still apply. Um, and that was that was incredibly helpful. Um, it was. Th those relationships, I just can't say enough about those relationships. Uh, knowing the folks at public health and having that trust uh, that we'd make good decisions um, and that we could go back and forth and ask those questions uh, was fabulous. And, th and that carried over very well. We can get to this later. That carried over very well into vaccination clinics and things like that as well. So, yeah, that excellent um, stuff, Hello. And, and I think you and I have probably seen the same thing, you know, our interfaces in health systems, right? So. You know, one of the roles a, a medical director does is sort of the, you're sort of the liaison to the rest of the world. Um, and so coordinating with the, uh, each of the healthcare systems and what would those handoffs look, uh, you know, at the hospital? That was operationally, we didn't talk about that, but that was one of the big things we sort of coordinated all locally is how are we going to alert the hospital that these patients were coming in and how are we going to handle those handoffs and where should those handoffs occur outside, inside? Um, those relationships made a huge difference in being able to do all that. It really exemplified how EMS fits in the triangle of public health, public safety, and then healthcare uh, in, in general. And um, when it came to uh, healthcare uh, with the pandemic, you know, I'm sure that you were still having uh, STEMIs and strokes and other healthcare emergencies. Uh, you still had to do training. You still had to do education. You still had to maintain your quality assurance programs. In the setting of the pandemic, when everything, the resources and time were focused on COVID, how did you maintain those other items that are essential for an EMS system? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And and you know, when you're first asking those questions, can be a little scary uh, in day one. So. A couple of things we were fortunate about, and, and again, lessons learned carrying forward. So number one is a buffer built in for your CE. So we were fortunate that we had, I want to say six months or better of a buffer built in so that uh, if we canceled training for the next month while we got our handle on this and we needed to staff people out to the out to the field because the way our training works is uh, they come they come on duty um, and those spots are, are backfilled on the streets. Well, if we were going to run out of, of people to do that, we were gonna be worried about that. But having a six month buffer that I knew everybody had enough hours, no one was gonna be at risk for a card renewal, a certification renewal, um, and be short on hours for at least six to nine months. Um, and then fortunately other things happened as well, like with state uh, deadlines extending after that. So, so that was helpful. Um, I think the other thing, you know, we'll talk about planning and, and I, I say this not to be, you know, off the cuff too much that sometimes you're lucky in what you have, but I think really what it is, is you just have to look around at what you already have and how can you repurpose it, right? So we had a learning management system and so we could transition some things pretty quickly that I didn't have to do in person. Is it the same? Can every lesson be done that way? Well, not, not necessarily, um, but we could, we could move those things. So it was really easy to teach the just-in-time training for the donning and doffing. Not so much that I could teach 
you know, an intubation of physical skill on that, but we could at least um, meet some operational aspects. We were able to talk infectious disease and we were able to, um, to train on some other things. So that bought us uh, some time as we figured out how training was gonna, gonna work, you know, once we did resume training, uh, spreading out and having, you know, uh, maintaining the distancing and all those aspects of, of our training environment and, and uh, what we needed to adjust within our training environment, you know, more instructors, less students, uh, more, uh, more mannequins, just whatever it was to spread those distances out and minimize that. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of impact in that. And I think, again, I think the biggest thing you probably do, and this is one of the things where the medical director plays a unique role, is, is you look around at what can, what do we already do that I can repurpose? Um, and repurposing a lot of that, uh, you really have done some planning that maybe you don't give yourself uh, credit for. Well, you mentioned uh, vaccines a couple times, so I'd like to transition onto that topic. And I have a few questions for you uh, in regards to the vaccinations. Um, the first one is, um, how did you go about educating your personnel about the vaccine? And uh, the follow-up question to that would be is, how have you uh, led your organization in the ability of your providers to administer the vaccine? Yeah, so great question, right? Because early on, um, people are concerned about disease. And so you start getting chatter about when are things coming, right? What are the new treatments? Um, and even before vaccines, pretty regularly, we're answering questions about should I take this or should I take that at home, you know? Uh, we all remember certain supplements being in the news and, and different um, what we thought might be potential treatments. And so those those questions were, were flowing in a lot. So I think that helped. Um, we did a number of things uh, because we did, were doing CE training. We were able to address some of those things, like here's what we know about the disease. This is why folks talk about this medicine and why they're at least interested in it. This is what we know so far that's, you know, that's not working or maybe a harm. It was also a, a, it was a great time to just talk about um, sort of revisiting general wellness. So, you know, what's the best thing for you? You know, take care of yourself, plenty of rest and right nutrition and right sleep. And were you, you know, were you doing the other things that didn't put you at risk uh, kind of stuff? So I, I think that became a natural platform that when it was time to talk about vaccine, we were already having discussions about what was the right thing for you to do um, as treatment. We had, um, we tried to have regular updates. I, I hope that they felt like they were fairly regular updates where either I was in front of them in a recorded format like this, or um, sometimes uh, because it was hard to pull stations together. And as we all transition to certain platforms like this, Zooms or WebExes or whatever, um, we were able, leadership got on. And so the, you know, fire chief would have meetings uh, a WebEx meeting where we got to talk to each of the battalions um, and the executive team was all there and we could answer questions that bounced all over from treatment and wellness to operations kind of thing. And, and so that the message was consistent, um, but it was also constant um, that it never felt like there was, at least it, the design was for the provider on the street. It never felt like there was a deficit of information. We were always trying to be uh, public and, and persistent in that. Um, and then once vaccines became uh, became obvious that they were becoming approved and stuff, um, we flat out did a, a training. I did a, a question and answers. I tried to do a frequently asked questions to address uh, what we felt were rumors, what we were seeing were rumors. You know, we each, uh, I would ask for what are you hearing? Are the concerns from folks? You know, each of us has our own sort of flavor on social media, what we see. And so trying to just answer those questions um, and be very, very transparent. I think the other thing um, a lot of us recognize in leadership in a department, whether you're the medical director, whether you're uh, executive leadership, fire leadership, is um, you, you tell them what you know and you and you tell them what you know the best information is. And so, at, at times, you just had to admit, you know, we don't know that answer yet, um, but we're going to try to help you make the best decision for you. So, I think that I think that helped with the credibility of the information that we did pass and the recommendations we made. Yeah, thank you. How did you get your um, How did you get your providers prepared to administer the vaccines? 
So that was pretty nifty. <laughs> Again, take advantage of, of what presents to you as well, right? So Columbus has a pretty significant special events operation um, that as you can imagine over, uh, over the early stages of the pandemic um, was not in high demand. Uh, all special events were gone, you know, concerts and ball games and professional sports and college sports and, and all that. Um, so it became pretty quick that that might be an option that might be a pool of, of folks to, to tap into. Um, th the other thing, again, that partnership with public health, we had some early conversations and they had just some fantastic ideas. So early on, um, early fall, late summer, early fall, there was the, the flu vaccination. So we actually leaned into doing flu vaccinations uh, more this year than we would have in a, in a normal year. One, because we knew that uh, the potential was coming and it became a nice training ground. Now, not just for providers getting comfortable giving shots because that's within scope of practice and really that training's pretty easy. Um, but we did lean on public health who uh, put together the training for us that was specific to the flu vaccine and or specific to COVID of, you know, what they wanted to see as far as site selection and and uh, cleaning and, and the volume we were going to be using and, and those sort of things. But operationally, so um, running public health runs the uh, the site and our folks are team members as vaccinators, but we were able to dry run the entire process uh, because we did a flu shot clinic. Um, and so working through and learning those lessons and becoming just operationally efficient that when uh, COVID vaccination came along, that was in place. And then as it ramped up, we were operationally experienced to be able to meet the, the pressures of uh, more folks per hour, more vehicles per hour um, through there. Um, it's it's taking advantage of those uh, of those processes that you have and just refining them a little bit to, to what you already have. So I am in Jackson's scope of practice, not hard. We just, we learned how to operationalize things for efficiency um, and, and leveraged it from there. Dr. Lowe, you're part of uh, the prestigious Eagles group where, the, where you're able to communicate with a lot of big city medical directors throughout the country. Um, what have you noticed from a national trend standpoint that we're learning from the COVID pandemic as it pertains to EMS clinical care or operations or anything that we're seeing in Columbus and also in other cities throughout the country? Yeah, so that's a that's another great partnership, right? We talked about those relationships you have um, early on that Eagles group, as as we call it. So roughly the fifty largest, the medical directors of the fifty largest uh, cities, fifty largest EMS organizations, were talking. So we literally had a, uh, a conference call every Tuesday, and, and to this day are still having that conference call every Tuesday. So you're able to uh, to learn, you know, lessons from other folks. So early on. Uh, was able to get the sort of inside information, if you will, or sort of the lessons learned um, from Washington State. Uh, within that group, everyone has sort of their own experience. And while we typically think of EMS medical directors as being more emergency medicine, there was a couple of EMS medical directors uh, in that group who were infectious disease trained folks. That was a huge, huge asset to be able to have someone who operationally and, and just understood both worlds and could combine them quickly for you. Um, and not that you couldn't have gotten to the same answer, but to get to that answer in an hour and a half call versus a three days worth of research on your own was, uh, was huge. Um, and then what were the impacts we were seeing? So pretty quick, uh, one of the things we, we had on that call was a, a question from one of the other cities about cardiac arrest. Hey, incidentally, noticed kind of an uptick in cardiac arrest. Is anyone else seeing this? Um, and that coalesced pretty quick of, yes, we're seeing it, you know, a number of people were, some people weren't. Um, and it became a very interesting conversation uh, that led to essentially some data collection uh, that we all did anyway. We all, you know, our, our normal QA process uh, for probably any EMS service uh, in the country, whether you run, uh, you know, five calls a day or or uh, 5,000 calls a day, you're looking at cardiac arrest and, and things like that. So seeing those numbers uh, go up and then having the resources to sort of pull those across multiple cities and, and see what the other variables were at the time. Uh, was it a marker for uh, COVID becoming insidiously into your into your location? Was it a, was it a marker for disparities in healthcare, uh, access to healthcare during shutdown? All of those sort of things. Fantastic uh, organization, fantastic group. And so, 
recently they uh, they did publish a, a paper in one of the online uh, Lancet journals um, that looked at cardiac arrest in the, in the setting of COVID. Um, and I don't think it's uh, you know it's no secret that we're keeping or anything, but uh, last year uh, cardiac arrests for the city of Columbus were were up and they were up significantly over prior years. Uh, when we plotted those out and that the slope of that curve changed about mid March, uh, as everything changed for us locally. That's so interesting. And, and I would imagine that it was interesting for you to be able to see the trends in Columbus and central Ohio and be able to uh, compare that to what other major cities were seeing as well. And I, I imagine that was very informative for you. It, it was informative. Sometimes it's scary informative, right? Um, because you also watched as other folks were hot spots. Um, it was it was informative because you you had to start thinking ahead uh, of what what do I need to prepare for next if if we get to be like you. And so you know we all know that uh, that New York City had a really hard time in April. It was a really incredible um, rate of infection and hospitalizations and all that. And so having those conversations and starting to say, all right, what do I need to plan for as a just in case? And, and I've used this phrase before, but um, I think in our line of work, most EMS medical directors would agree, most EMS planners, fire leadership would agree that um, if you're using the last plan you're on, you probably haven't done enough planning, right? The, the goal should be there's two more plans on the shelf that I haven't gotten to yet, because at least my brain is moving that far ahead should things get worse. Um, and you hope you don't get to those, you know, some of the, some of the uh, just really in-depth things you, you hope you don't get to, but you at least need to have thought about them. There needs, needs to be, what's going to be my next step if, you know, if uh, we look like New York City and, and our hospitals are full, if, um, you know, our workforce is depleted, just all of those kind of things. You have to at least be thinking about what are those skeleton outlines and what are those next plans. And so it was super helpful to look at those cities and see those challenges to anticipate what do I need, what do I think I need to plan for next? What are the contingencies in the back of my mind? And I say me, it's us as an organization. I don't mean to to say that, uh, you know, individually. It's just uh, all of us were, you know, I would immediately take those lessons back to our planning committees and we would, we would massage those across all of the fantastic minds we had at the table and all the different expertise at the table and folks with just incredible experience in, in dealing with any number of uh, you know, big events in, in Columbus Fire and in the community, so. Well, you mentioned cardiac arrest data, and I know there was a lot of focus on time critical diagnoses. How do you intubate? How do you manage the airway? Um, what about your, you know, so to speak, omega responses? So your uh, REACT team, uh, the not really community paramedics, but your al alternative response and alternative operations. How was that aspect of your medical directorship and your organization affected by the pandemic? Yeah, so that's uh, that's a great question because that's in you know concerns for an immediate pivot as well. What are those uh, What are those risks to those providers? You know, classically, when we all think about those sort of outreach programs, we we picture those folks spending more time in the home and more time uh, engaged with those patients. Um, and now we're living in a world of six feet and 15 minutes and, and closed environments versus outside air and all that. So pretty quickly, uh, some of those specialized teams had subsets of the action plan, like how, how are they going to handle that? Um, and React, just to use React as the, as the biggest example, um, how did they do their community days, you know, their outreach days? Excuse me. Um, and so just adjusting those plans. And then like many of us, uh, leveraging uh, those technology aspects already. So maybe there was more cell phone type uh, things, video chats, um, and not necessarily like we're doing on a on a big computer, but just using the, you know, the cell phone uh, aspect. So uh, more effort to do some reach out and check in with the known patients, uh, more effort to try to get those referrals, uh, you know, from hospitals and things like that. And recognizing that, that some of our, you know, in our React world, uh, some of those patients were at increased risk during the pandemic not only from underlying disease, health disparities and resources, but the isolation aspect of all the shutdowns and things like that. So now um, what, uh, what sort of emotional and social pressures are on these folks and what sort of isolation do they have as far as friends, uh, family, support systems to help them through times of need, but also just to be present 
uh, and, and monitor them for when their health became a concern, you know, someone else to activate the 911 system. Um, it was, I, I feel like the teams did well in that, but, you know, there was, there was obviously um, some challenges uh, in that. So. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, looking forward, I think we're all anxious about what we're going to see moving forward with the COVID numbers. Uh, we could easily have another spike. Uh, you know, we could easily stay uh, status quo or we could have decreased number of cases. For you, what does getting back to business or back to baseline look like? And what permanent changes do you see coming from this pandemic that could affect your medical protocol, uh, your operational guidelines, how you uh, quality assure runs and so forth? Yeah. Um... Let me kind of dive on that in, in two pieces. What do I hope will happen for, for normal? Um, you know, I hope at some point, you know, as a, as a fire-based EMS service, uh, this is a very community-oriented service, right? So just, you know, kids being able to visit a firehouse, uh, folks being able to show up, uh, being able to do community events and outreach. You know, I hope those come back pretty quick. Um, I hope that, uh, that, that families uh, get to come see their loved one when they're at work. Um, but I also hope that we get to do some of our outreach. You know, we haven't, we haven't been in schools uh, to do fire safety or uh, fire drills or even education days. We have, uh, you know, being in, in some of these events, senior, senior living centers and having some interaction with your community and, and those folks. So I, I hope that that comes back uh, as the new normal. Um, what are lessons learned that'll stick? You know, we modified several aspects of how we sort of do cleaning and things like that. And uh, not to get into, you know, not to tout one product over another, just tell you what we have. So uh, we had something called an aeroclave unit, this ability to sort of static spray a, a cleaning solution and have it, uh, have it disinfect an, an area uh, was a, an item we had, literally a item. Um, that going forward, we now have multiple of those items. So I can see us um, having learned a lot of lessons in how we um, keep our own work environment safe. And whether that's the back of the truck, uh, whether that's the, the firehouse, uh, the bunk rooms, those sorts of things. So I, I suspect we're going to see, um, I think all of us in healthcare are probably a little bit better uh, at our own personal hygiene as far as, you know, the hand washing and the gloving and things like that. I think we've learned lessons in, in disinfecting about uh, what works well and what works quickly. So I think those sorts of machines are going to last. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've kind of learned a, a few lessons about how we track our own health um, and how at least the necessity of that uh, will probably stay a little bit. Um, you know, hopefully um, we don't lose this too quick, but our ability to select our PPE, you know, I've been in the EMS and emergency medicine for a long time. We we sometimes are a little bit more um, stubborn, might be the right word, about uh, our protection. Um, so I think that we're probably going to be a little bit better coming out of this about selecting the right uh, protection for ourselves um, based on our, our assessment of our situation and our patients, so those sorts of things. So, I, you know, off the top of my head, I'd say that's the big ones. Um, internally, did we learn, learn other lessons? Yeah, we learned, you know, we learned a lot of things just by, again, seeing what was happening around us. So we, we did some different staffing models, uh, during the pandemic to try to lessen, I'll call it cross contamination, but the cross pollination of stations and battalions mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and we learned some, some wellness, like we, we had some happy lessons out of that, of, of work satisfaction and, uh, things like that. So I think there'll be operational lessons that extend beyond infectious disease. So just how you do staffing and scheduling and things like that might, might be some, some positives that come out of kind of something like this. So. Well, thank you for your perspective on that. And I want to thank you for your time during the session, Dr. Lowe, um, your leadership for the city and for central Ohio and uh, for the EMS community has been remarkable throughout this pandemic and in your time at Columbus Fire. So I, I wanna personally thank you for that. Um, 
and give you the opportunity to just provide any closing thoughts um, for our listeners um, about COVID and then the lessons learned. Well, first, thank you, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you I have just a, an incredible uh, collection of, of folks of which I am just a small part at Columbus Fire. So uh, folks with experience in all kinds of uh, responses and lessons and infections and disease and operations, uh, it was a huge team effort, um, and it was it was challenging, but it was rewarding to be uh, to be a part of. Um, you know, going forward, as far as lessons learned, I, I think uh, you know, I think we've driven home some of the lessons that we always kind of knew. Those those relationships are extremely important um, within your organization, beyond your organization, and things that may not always uh, be obvious, um, but that but that they're good uh, relationships, you know, supplier relationships and health system relationships and, and who else uh, in the city the, do you interface with and those kind of things. You know, uh, Columbus, greater Columbus area is a hugely interwoven response system. Um, and so all of my fellow medical directors and all of our fellow departments, there was a, there was a lot of synergy that happened around this and it, it was, uh, it was interesting and um, rewarding to be a part of. So, thanks. I agree with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, the uh, synergy and the collaboration um, was just, it was a great to be part of that uh, throughout the past year. And hopefully we can continue that moving forward as well. Um, but thanks again for your time. This was, uh, th this was excellent. And we certainly appreciate your perspective. For our listeners, make sure to check out our site, ohiohealthems.com for continuing education on this session. Also check out our other online virtual content, including other EMS Grand Rounds and lectures, our podcast, uh, and uh, a, a great deal of resources for online continuing education. Um, if you have any questions about this session or questions in general about Ohio Health EMS, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. Uh, I'm, I welcome any questions, feedback, or comments. And if you have anything for Dr. Lowe specifically, I can forward that on to him as well. And lastly, just want to wish all of our listeners and the EMS providers happy EMS week. We appreciate everything that you do for our community and for our patients, and we really value our relationship with you. Uh, thank you again, and we'll see you soon.